Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new episode of PHT TV. Today we're going to be covering another iteration of the Q&A section. So you guys have lots of questions and we're happy to answer those. So we're going to dive right into another Q&A session here. So do you want to do any explanation or just jump right in? Let's jump in. We jump had some in. fun questions come up this time. Yeah. So uh, the first question that I want to cover is how can you set up a three channel sound as PWK inventioned with modern equipment? So, uh, well, because the capability to do three point stereo wasn't available in the quote processing of the day, Paul created a circuit that he could put in to help solve that problem. In today's world, we don't have that problem. We don't need it. Yeah. I put it in multi channel and I'd tell it to, that there is a right, a left, and a center, but no surrounds. That puts you in three channel quote stereo and you'll get a quote mono signal off that center speaker. Or should get a mono signal off the center speaker. If your source material is two channel, then how would you set that up? You have to tell it to be like a ProLogic or a, 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 a DTS Neo 6 or one of the other processing uh, formats that the receivers can do. And then it will grab right and left and turn it into a, a a phase coherent mono, okay. which is the big problem on, a, on that is, is you can run in, you can get a mono or a quasi mono center, but it won't be phase coherent necessarily. That's a big thing to do is try to keep the, the phase coherent in the center channel so that you don't run into uh, cancellation problems between right and left center. Okay. And what is your, what is your take on the all channel stereo mode? Uh, the ones that I've used, it kind of screws with the stereo image drastically. It's not like your car. You know, when you hear all channel stereo, I think right and left front, right and left rear, it's stereo like in my car. It's not the case. That's not the way they decode it. In my opinion, you lose some definition in the center channel, even though you have a dedicated location for center, the intelligibility has gone. The depth of the stereo image is gone. It's no longer really stereo when you're sitting in it. At least to me, it doesn't sound that way. Of course, that's just my opinion. You know, as yeah. Daddy said, fifty cents in a cup, buy you, in my opinion, will buy you a cheap cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I personally do use all channel stereo at times. Um, Background music, yeah, it works fine. Background music, yeah. that's uh, what it's good for. <laughs> that kind of takes us into our next question because uh, diving into that, one of our questions was <clears throat> for anything. So we're talking about all channel stereo and left versus right and center speaker. For anyone thinking of choosing a heritage speaker pair, what might be an alternative as a center speaker, assuming that the center speaker is not the same as the left and the right? And I, it sounds like we've kind of drilled it in the head <laughs> <something> <laughs> <better>. <laughs> enough. The fact that they had to add that at the end, assuming it's not the same. Somebody's been listening. Yes, that's good. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have the option to, um, to place another, say, three Fortes, three La Scalas, and you want to use... How do you, set, how do you decide what to use? Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of form factor dependent. So, I mean, if you're well, looking for a horizontal center versus just something more compact, so say put a Heresy in with some Fortes, then the answer is going to be slightly different. So, Yeah. You know, when, over the years working tech support for Klipsch, one of the ways that we answered that question was we look at the technical specifications of the speaker. For example, uh, is it a Tractrix horn or a hybrid Tractrix horn? If so, they're going to result similar, right? Mm -hmm. Other than a, 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 a exponential horn like in the, uh, the K horn or the La Scala or the Heresy. You've got exponential mid-ranges there and that exponential mid-range will sound different than the, the Tractrix horn, mm -hmm. which is the reason Paul wanted to go to Tractrix. <laughs> it was things about that Tractrix curve or Tractrix expansion uh, that is pleasing and, and solves some problems that you run into inherently because you don't get something for nothing <laughs> in, you know, in, in some of the other products. So we would say try to match the style of horn. Also, you try to match the sensitivity. Uh, you also try to match the bandwidth of the speaker. Uh, for example, if uh, you know RF7s use the 64 typically as a center channel, with, that's because the cone air volume moved by the cones on the 64 are fairly similar to the air volume move of the single cone on the seven. 
So the 10 and the two six, six and a halfs have approximately the same VAS or, or volume of air that they can move. And the tweeters the same in both models. The tweeters well. are the same in both models. So they match very, very well together. Uh, if I were to go out to another speaker, say I wanted a, a center channel for heresies, I would look at the capabilities of a product line and say what speaker that's smaller than the heresy can I put there that would, uh, that would number one, keep up with the heresy, sensitivity, output capabilities, bandwidth capabilities. Even if you look at your home theater receivers and you have 12 dB of gain that you can move one way or the other, you can make up some of the efficiency. But let's face it, we don't want John Wayne to sound like John Wayne on the right and left speaker, but Mickey Mouse in the middle, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you want to have a speaker that can, can acoustically keep up with your, your right and left as well as uh, tonally keep up with your right and left. So you want those things to sound very similar. So when you see it, when you see it posted over and over again, your center channel for your heresies should be another heresy. That's kind of the reason is because there's not necessarily another speaker that will be as efficient, that can keep up with those guys, that can, be, can meet all those points that Trey covered in order to sound the best in your system. There are, the, there are other center channels that you could use, but it's not gonna be perfect. Agree. You, you know, you, you give up. You know, you, you give up a little bit for the form factor. You give up a little bit for the uh, uh, for the size of the drivers. You know, so so having things match. You have to stop and think about where this come from. How did we get into home theater? Well, it came from the movies. Mm -hmm. Well, at the movie house, at the cinema, it's all the same up front. Why? Well makes sense, right? It's a lot easier to balance them if they're all exactly the same. And it's a lot easier to get sensitivity. This, I mean, they're all the same. So there's no, no give or take there. It works. And uh, uh, the proper way in that frame of mind would be to follow that into, this, into the home theater world. The problem is, is in the home theater world, most cinemas aren't in a dedicated room necessarily. They're in the living room. <laughs> you know, and there's other people in the house that you have to deal with that, excuse me, there's other people in the house that, that have input on that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Trey you, likes to go back to his wife acceptance factor, I think is what he's getting I at. I do, yeah. and my lovely wife accepts all of it, so bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is use the right speaker if you can. Use the same thing if you can. If you can't, a lot of the systems are made for the smaller form factor center such as the RC64 Mark III versus the RF7 Mark III's. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a, a very good combination because they are built to work together. If you were to go out and grab a speaker out of the entire Klipsch line to run as a center channel on a heresy that wasn't a heresy, what would I get? There are a few pro speakers that you could do, but they're about the same size as a heresy, so why wouldn't you use a heresy? <laughs> uh, I, there, think, I think there's the not an actual small center that's gonna keep up, except for the 64. What so, about so the RP line? So the, so RP. the sensitivity is, is close. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't have a problem with doing that. Uh, the RP line, I look at it the same way. Even though the horns are different, you have other qualities that you can match up and try to get them to, to work. Is it gonna be perfect? No, it's not gonna sound exactly the same in the center as it does right and left. But what percentage of people are going for perfect versus form factor? So if you're looking for a form factor to sit in there, uh, reference premier line is gonna work great for you. Um, I probably wouldn't lean towards the reference line because they're changing completely all the materials used inside the speakers as well. But uh, the reference premier line and the RC64 are gonna be great options for you. Yeah, because you're, it, it, that, in the, if you're looking at the current heresy, mm -hmm. you're looking at, at the, uh, uh, the titanium drivers as well, so that stays true in the, in in the reference, the reference premier. premier line. Yeah. So that, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Try to get all the things you can to match in the center and the, in the right and left as, you, as, uh, as possible, simply because the more of those things that you can check the box on, the closer it's gonna be. Okay. I think that's... That probably about covers that one, doesn't it? I would think so. All right. <laughs>
So do everything that you can to so, match. So what's funny about that question is he knew the right answer anyway. <laughs> right? He said, besides the right answer, what else could I do? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have room for another heresy. I don't have room for another forte. <laughs> well, whatever. In, in the words of Jill Eskel, build one. Yes. <laughs> one of my favorite stories is that uh, she... You guys can look this up on YouTube, but Jill of Klipsch actually bought a new house to suit her K-horns. <laughs> they went looking for a house, and if the K-horns wouldn't work, it was thrown out and they went on to the next house. When they found a house, the K-horns would work properly in the house, that's the one they bought. <laughs> We're not gonna talk uh, too much about that there because there is a YouTube video completely dedicated to that. So definitely go check that out, it's worth a watch. We didn't do that one. But... So yes, there are girls, or ladies, excuse me, that are just as into this as, as the guys. For sure. But the percentage seems to be lower. Looking at our, our analytics on this, uh, on this page, this may be getting it too deep into it, but I think it's like 0.5% in male versus, or female versus male right now. 0.5? I'm impressed. Yeah. I expect <laughs> it to be lower than that. <laughs> so, I may cut that portion, but it's kind of interesting. No, which is a good point. You know, all these guys doing this and, and watching this, this uh, YouTube channel, maybe they should bring their wives and their significant others into that, the females of the, of the family, in and watch, talk about some of this stuff and get them excited. Mm -hmm. That's what it took about my wife. You know, she, <laughs> she had never, I mean, it, it made noise, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I can hear it, it's okay. And until I carried her in and set her in the sweet spot and talked her through why I set her there, talked her through what to listen for, and then made her shut her eyes and listen to that system, when she come away, she's almost in tears. Mm -hmm. You know, she plays the guitar a little bit. She plays piano fairly well. She understands that part, and the emotion that she got from that, that system being set up properly and her in that sweet spot in the, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the movement of the music really struck her. And from then on, she's, she's hooked, yeah. <laughs> you know? And you don't go back either. That's, that's oh, no. kind of the, uh, my wife, the moment it hit her was, um, we've had all these systems in our house forever and she, I feel like she took it for granted. And then we went out to a hotel. We went to a hotel on vacation and we turned on the TV just to watch some TV and neither of us could stand listening to it. She's like, we, we had to turn off the TV because the speaker sounded so poorly. <laughs> so you never go back. We can't go anything. We can't do sound bars anymore. We can't do TV mm -hmm. audio. Well, it just, there's, there's no going back. When we were traveling, we actually carried either a sound bar or a, uh, a, a one with us. <laughs> and we, we kind of started looking for hotels that had used TVs that had audio out <laughs> so that we could actually hook up our, 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 our clip speaker to the TV so we could actually put up with listening to it. It's, it's hard to do. So, I mean, that, that makes all the difference in the world. And it's, it's crazy how just hearing the right system makes you recognize the wrong. <laughs> it's essentially how that goes, so. What's your next question over there? Let's see, so. This is kind of a broad question. It's uh, what are the most common issues that affect speaker performance? Hisses, line noise, rattles. How do you tell if your speaker is broken or if you set something up wrong? And how do you optimize performance based on the setup? So essentially just general troubleshooting what issues, like the primary issues that you see that go wrong the most. Now, they believe... take the speaker out of an anechoic chamber and put it in somebody's room. Done. <laughs> so I that, think uh, that, that damages the sound of that speaker the most because <laughs> your room is the most controlling sounding part of your system. That's so true. if you can't go through and stop all the buzzes and rattles and, and excited things in the room, then that will never, you'll have to do that if you want to not hear those things. You know, and if you play at any serious volume with any serious bass response, you will find a loose part. Something in your room will be loose or something in the room two stories above you would be loose. Because, and you still hear it, you still hear well, it. Well, bass response, you know, 40 hertz notes, 36 feet. Well, that's about third floor. <laughs> well, that's there, their problem. <laughs> but, well, unless it's your, your floor and, and the wife's in bed asleep and you're downstairs in the basement playing something and all of a sudden the, the pictures start falling off the walls and hitting in the bed. 
<laughs> so uh, one of the other hiss factors though, we had discussed the difference between cables and wires wow. in, a, in our previous Q&A video. So the importance of cables is a little bit more important than the choice of wiring and gauge wiring. So. Absolutely. First off, you're dealing with much, much, much smaller voltages and currents. Mm -hmm. So because they're smaller, the thing that it travels on it is much more detrimental if there's problems with it or disadvantages in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about shielding on RCA cables, for example, where as a very cheap RCA cable I've seen can have one single strand of copper running from one end to the other. As I think I said before, Paul had a nice little button that said bullshit <laughs> on it. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the cables that, that you see that are really high, uh, quality shielding, uh, good outside casing, good platings on the RCAs. You know, it doesn't have to be a thousand dollars, but a twenty dollar, thirty dollar RCA cable isn't out of the out of the question. And that's typically a really nice cable that'll last you a really long time. Mm -hmm. So I think when uh, uh, when we were over at the uh, warehouse, the warehouse tour, yeah. with Corey, we noticed some of the SVS SoundPath cables. Mm -hmm. You know, from from what I saw, those are really nice cables, and for a reasonable reasonable price. You know, you're not going to break the bank, but it's good quality stuff. Mm -hmm. The so, Monster cables have always done well. The um, Audio Quest Audio cables. Quest. Audio Quest has been a, a a leader in that industry for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and carries really they they manufacture and carry really nice products. So cables. Wires, completely different scenario. So it is important to have proper shielding, especially if you are doing, we don't recommend this, but like if you're running a line with power cables beside it or anything like that, that is another common problem where you get some noise in the line as if. It, it, you can because it's called eddy currents. Uh, you see that in a transformer when you have uh, windings butted together with metal between, the electricity can jump from one to the other. That's how a transformer works. Uh, it's called eddy currents. And because you have electrical voltages and currents on a uh, power wire, and if you run them parallel with a preamp cable, and if you think about it, that power wire is one set, the shielding is your in between and the wire in the middle of that preamp cable is your secondary. So you've created a transformer. Well, this one's 60 hertz and has a whole lot of it. Guess where it's gonna go? <laughs> Over here. <laughs> so, you know, it, that's not a, I mean, common sense says it's not a good idea, but that's the electrical reason. You can pick up eddy currents and if you don't have a very good shielded cable or you have a broken shield or you have a single <laughs> strand of copper in your wire, <laughs> in your cable. Charlie's really shielding. pissed about that. <laughs> I, I felt so ripped off when I, did I cut the cable and went, what the? I, I digress. But yeah, you can run into absolute, run into problems. Uh, so that that is why uh, on longer runs, especially in professional systems, they use balanced connectors because it, it degrade or uh, cancels, uh, cancels out or eliminates a lot of that, uh, that noise. So the question was, what are the most common issues you run into with like hiss and stuff like that? So room noise? Room noise is probably the number one. Uh, a bad cable. Bad connections. Bad happens cables. a lot. Uh, another one that happens is the, when you're dealing with a speaker like Clips, and, and almost every product they make has, it has a really high efficiency. So when you're really dealing with a speaker that's 100, like, like the speaker behind us, the K-Horn, it's 105 dB, one watt, one meter. At, a, at one watt, that's twice as loud as any city ordinance will allow at 50 feet, you know? So essentially so, your, your issues are exponential. They... <laughs> well, yeah, it really is because the thing is so blast efficient it sees the smallest amount of energy and reproduces it. Mm -hmm. Well, if your amplifier has any, uh, any of this, the noise oh, problems, you know, the signal to noise ratio is too low or the, uh, uh, the uh, total harmonic distortion is too high, you're gonna hear it in that, in that speaker. And you're gonna hear it typically uh, 
it'll sound like putting a, a seashell up to your ear. You know, it's shh going off in the, in the speaker. And it's strictly the uh, amplifier circuit in, that am in the amplification unit providing that for you. And it's just it functioning doing it. Yeah. And that's why when I preached about, in, in our pr previous thing, I preached about amplifiers. You want high signal noise ratio, uh, high dampening factor, low total harmonic distortion, the amount of power, double the amount of power you need for your speaker, and the bandwidth uh, to cover the whole thing. Those are the five things typically you need. You get all those in the amplifier, you're probably gonna have a really good amp. Well, another thing we didn't mention yet is clean power. So you saw in the other videos we're watching, we are using that Surge X Surge Protector, or Surge Protector Power Conditioner. We're using that power conditioner in order to make sure that all the power coming into the ampl amplifier is clean before it gets to the... You're talking about two times of power too. We're talking about voltage, you know, line voltage. Mm -hmm. We want to make that as clean as you can and as steady as you can and as frequency correct as you can. 60 hertz. When you, when you don't have that right, then your amplifier will not perform at its peak, period. Garbage in, garbage out. We talked about that yesterday. So essentially you need to check every component in line. So whether it be you have multiple separates or just a single amp, you need to go from your power source to the amp to the speaker and make sure every component in line is getting the proper, the proper care that it deserves. True, and over time, those things being electrical connection, it will build up, build up some oxidization. So after a year or so, every year when you decide to take your system apart and clean it and get all the cobwebs out of the, out of the console or whatever, be sure and pull those RCAs off and clean them. Take a, 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 one of the old high school erasers and erase the outside of that, that uh, jacket on the RCA. Take all the oxidization off. That kind of thing can really help when it comes to noises. The signal noise ratio in the amplifier and the uh, 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 total harmonic distortion, those are the things that kind of set that noise floor. And if you don't have extremely low noise floor in an in a, uh, amplifier, it's gonna show up in the efficient speaker. Not only do they show off, do, does a very efficient speaker and an articulate speaker like, like the Clips Line show off the, uh, the quality of the speaker and the quality of the recording, and the bad recordings, it also shows off the amplifier's quality and bad qualities. So if there's an amplifier out there that has a lot of noise inherently uh, without signal, you will hear that noise in an efficient speaker. So this question, it says, when streaming from a phone or laptop, where and how should I adjust EQ and volume on the device, on the AVR or both? Uh, and essentially, this can be covered not just a laptop or a phone, just any source in general. So, this is this is uh, this is a couple of different questions in one. Mm -hmm. What they're actually asking about is gain structure. What's the proper gain structure when I'm doing those kinds of things? There's a lot of points of view about gain structure when you're coming from a streaming device like that. Uh, for example. Uh, you know whether you're you're using your receiver as your as the receiving device from your phone or your laptop or whether you're using one of the little puck items from whatever brand that that takes that Wi-Fi signal and converts it into a audio signal can send to your system if I understand it correctly you're not technically sending anything from your laptop or your phone that device is going out to the web and getting it you're just telling it to do that. 100% depends on the source itself. So say you're using like Chromecast or something to that effect. Once you tell it what to do, it takes it from the web. Your phone is out of the out equation of the picture, whatsoever. Right. But like they mentioned like a Bluetooth connection or something like that. It, your phone is the source material at that point. Where Absolutely. You're controlling the volume. Absolutely. So, so it does depend on how you're connecting that device. If when we say wireless for me, I instantly go to Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, because I, I Bluetooth, he hates Bluetooth. <laughs> yeah, I am not a fan of Bluetooth. I, I, I don't like the quality from most Bluetooth pieces that I've heard. And, uh, and that 35 feet pisses me off. <laughs> yeah. I have my phone in my pocket. I'll go walking away. And next thing I hear is the wife in another room. Get back 
in here. You're cutting out. Yeah, you took the phone. You took the source. You took the yeah. yeah. Bluetooth, latest generations of Bluetooth have improved significantly. <laughs> but those early generations were rough. You had to be in the same room and everything, or you lost significant quality and you lost the breakout. It was rough. But uh, Unfortunately, Bluetooth, likes me, to, for me, is like going to the restaurant and getting a bad dinner. Mm -hmm. You know, getting sick off of it. It's never the last back. time I go back to that restaurant. <laughs> so I've kind of gotten away from Bluetooth we'll and never it. looked to see what their new things have done. Yeah. I, I primarily use the Wi-Fi based stuff as well. Uh, more than anything else, I do the whole home audio. It's reliable. So reliable, multi, multi streaming. You can do multiple speakers at once. Whereas only recently did Bluetooth get into that ability where you can stream to multiple sources. And a lot of times that is limited to connected, but not streaming to at the same time. So. You can connect to two devices, but if I click on this device, then it's going to switch over. But anyways, that's getting fun. Kind of off, deep into off it. topic a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the, the answer to your statement, how do I set that up in the game structure? Depends. So it depends <laughs> on how you're connecting. And, uh, and, and let's assume that we're using Wi-Fi. At that point, your phone is just an a ambient volume knob. It's not doing anything. The piece over there is doing it. Mm -hmm. So if that piece is doing it, it's it's the good piece. If you're connecting to the headphone out of your device going into a unit, now you're dealing with a different gain structure because no longer you're dealing with the gain structure at that piece over receiving the Wi-Fi signal. You're actually in the device you're holding or using is your gain structure setup. So. Uh, the next question is, is how much out do you have capable and how much in does that piece want? <laughs> you know, and a lot of units are, uh, are, are set up for headphones, not line out. And most people don't realize there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, headphones are an audio amplifier designed to drive a relatively low impedance driver, like a speaker, and so the outputs are set up differently. On a line out, line out isn't designed for that. It's designed for a 10K or 15K impedance load, not something low impedance. So the op amps and all the drivers are different. So, so the aux output on your phone is different than the aux input on the, on the amp. Correct, correct, because it's a headphone out, not a aux out. Now on your computer, some of them actually on, on the computer I use, it calls it line out or headphone out. You can have it choose and it chooses different game structures such as. So it actually smart enough that when you plug it in, it recognizes the impedance. And at the low impedance, it sets the computer sets up for headphones. At a higher impedance, it sets up as a line level, which is nice. It's you know? cool. Yeah. It's good that the computer's smart enough to do that because most and of the time I'm not smart enough to remember. <laughs> It's not smart enough. It's a uh, short-term memory loss and all. <laughs> oh, I, I, that's, I what the, yeah. that's what the gray hair is about. <laughs> it's old. So I think it would be a good idea to have phones start doing that because I, I mean, every you get into a car, you plug in the aux jack. You know, if it's not Bluetooth, or yeah. it, it it would be nice if there was a little more structure there. But because ninety percent of the things out there are going away from the cable, mm -hmm. which so I'm an old school guy, so I like cables. Yeah, <laughs> they don't fail as often as that Wi-Fi stuff. Or wireless yeah. stuff. <laughs> they fail more permanently. You buy better cables and you won't have that problem. <laughs> I can break any cable, trust me on that. It's hard to break the wire of a Bluetooth connection, but... I'll just stand in front of it. <laughs> but it comes back. Once you, once you lose a cable, it's gone forever. Yeah. But, um, so, so when do you adjust it? Gain structure, uh, it again comes down to what you're doing. Typically, most of the time on any of that stuff, I'll run my gains on my preamp section or my this control. I'll run it at the three quarter or, or almost max, just like I would a line, just like line level from a CD player would be. Mm -hmm. And then I use my control on my receiver for my volume. Mm -hmm. If I'm not going to be where I can use that control, then I do it just the opposite. I turn my receiver up to a certain point and I use this guy for my volume control. It really doesn't matter in that stance because you're going to get a good signal most either way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the lower end of your handheld device, uh, volume control or gain control, whichever it truly is, uh, I think you'll have more noise there than you will at the, at, at the three quarters mark. Mm -hmm. and That's if, what I've always been taught is 75% uh, volume on the source and then 
whatever on the receiving end. Yeah. If you, over, if you try and drive them too hard, you'll run into the problems with the output stages of that device. If you drive it too low, you run into the noise problems of that device. <laughs> so the torque curve or in the middle is the best place. Happy spot, your sweet spot. Yeah, <laughs> find that sweet spot. Uh, so the, the next question that we had is, what is the clip sound? And honestly, I, how do you answer that in words? Like you, you have to hear it you, to know. <laughs> what does a Harley sound like? Vroom. <laughs> right? <laughs> How you much know? are you going to get from that over Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to use one of Klipsch's taglines. Mm -hmm. Power, detail, and emotion. That's about the best description of the Klipsch DNA that you can give. Yeah, you feel the power. Very detailed. You hear everything that goes in to the recording comes out of that speaker and the emotion, the chills that you get when you hear it, the, the tears. So ho <laughs> hopefully the emotion of the music passes to you without, with the transparent, transparent conduit. That's the idea is we want that artist's intent and the engineer of that music's intent to touch the soul of the listener. Power, detail, emotion. Yeah. Especially to harp on the demo, the uh, emotion portion. harp on the emotion portion because a lot of people that you interview talking about clip speakers is the first time I heard it it brought tears to my eyes I had goosebumps I had just this feeling I had chills all over my body they talk about that emotion that it in that it in uh, um, incites in them so to describe what is the clip sound it is. That is what it is. It's the feeling you get when you hear these speakers. And, you know, we talk about that, and there are other speakers out there that may give you a great feeling, but it's almost a religious experience sometimes. Uh, Go for the it. next one we had, um, what, what drives people to keep coming back to Klipsch? Same answer, essentially. <laughs> the feeling well, you get when you hear it. That and it's, you know, when you can go out and buy a 30-year-old speaker and the sound signature of that speaker is so close to the sound signature of what you can go buy brand new. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it makes it really hard to sell new ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another, another factor is it's kind of almost an addiction. Like once you, once you get spoiled <laughs> to a degree, yeah, you know, you don't want to listen to anything it, else. It's like that kid that had to walk to school every day and then all of a sudden he got a bicycle. He never wanted to walk again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, I want to ride that bicycle. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's the why we as humans don't walk as much as we drive or ride now because it's more efficient. It's a better way to get there. Well, once you find that better way, why would you want to go back? What is the process behind designing a crossover? You know, without going into the details, mm -hmm. you can touch the high points and get there. All right. So when an engineer goes into a meeting and they get told, create a speaker and we want the speaker to meet these specs. So they go out and they spec the parts to make that speaker. They test those raw parts. Then they test those raw parts in the supposed cabinet for those raw parts. And once they get that, they pull that data and do a, uh, a computer simulation. And that computer simulation tells them, uh, helps them decide what parts or what uh, crossover definitions they need. The slopes, the crossover point, that kind of stuff. Once they get that done electronically, they then go back and create a, an acoustic passive version of that and compare the passive versus electronic to get the passive tweaked as close to the electronic as they can. Once they get that, they put it all together and test the speaker. If that tests properly, they then deem that speaker as the standard, and then they send that information out to the manufacturing plant and have the manufacturing plant reproduce what they did. Then they pull a multitude of those back in independently. They compare them all to that standard. They pick a several that match that standard and they give the, the, the engineers a pair, they get, or two or three pair. They give the, the manufacturing plants two or three pairs so they, everybody gets a quote, golden standard of that speaker. Match but, across the board. But that's across them. So everybody has to meet that same standard within a 
plus or minus 2 dB. Well, the crossover portion of that, uh, it comes down to that mid-range, that, that driver complement in the speaker and how you make those things combined together. Now you can get down in the weeds real deep on that kind of stuff. And unless you had a chamber and a crossover that you could tear apart and change parts and show what things happened when you did it, I don't know how a verbal communication like this is gonna pass that along. Mm -hmm. But uh, as from a 5,000 foot view, that's kind of the process of how a speaker comes to be. So that crossover point, that crossover is done electronically uh, at Klipsch before they create a passive version of it. All right. <laughs> Fairly short. <laughs> yeah. These are actually, all five of these questions, I believe, were from the same person um, when they posted it. But how does a Klipsch horn work? So the best way to describe how a Klipsch horn works hey! <laughs> is to see it visually. <laughs> we're just going to ignore Trey there. <laughs> The best way to describe how a K-horn works is to see it visually because you look outside of it and it's just a big box. You don't see what's going on inside. You don't see the folds of the horn. You don't see anything. Trey has ADD and as soon as I asked him a question, he got up and took off without saying what he's doing, but we went for a visual aid. <laughs> went for a visual aid. This is the LF section of a clip horn. It has a driver tied to a compression driver tied to a horn and the horn flares out. I mean, it's the same thing, except on the clip horn, this portion is eight foot long. <laughs> and this portion is a 15 inch woofer. And this portion is the inside cabinet of that LF speaker. <laughs> so it's exactly like this, only completely different. Only completely different. different. <laughs> so, the, the point for the visual aid, right? <laughs> <laughs> the point being, it is just a horn. Mm -hmm. Right? A very, very, very large big horn. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the horn on the, on the K-horn actually is about five foot by five foot mouth, maybe six foot by six foot mouth, this portion. Mm -hmm. So it would be square, six by six. Mm -hmm. And then the length of that horn from the throat to the mouth is about eight foot. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, if you straighten it out, it's, it's about eight foot long. And they, they did that. They confirmed that the LF section in a full straight horn worked just as well folded as it did in thing. Of course, we knew this already because tubas work, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and basically what happens is, is the sound comes out of the driver into the horn, in the mouth of that horn. And in the K horn, it immediately, immediately splits and goes vertical. So part of that, it hits a wedge. And when it goes up, it hits another shelf that's slanted. And that shelf then makes it split this way. And as it goes around, it hits the tailboard. And when it hits the tailboard, it turns back around like that. So it makes one, two, three turns before it actually hits the wall. And of course, the wall is then amplifying it or pushing it into the room mm -hmm. from an eighth space loading. So what's interesting about a clip horn that isn't the case with most other, speak most other speakers is the clip horn you are actually setting inside the speaker, the low frequency speaker. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of the speakers, your free space around that speaker, you can, that's, you know, you're in the space. In a clip horn, you actually are setting inside the LF section of the speaker because the corner of the room is the last fold of the horn. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different feeling. The haptic sensation or that, that feeling when you sat in the car as a kid at the railroad track and you felt the train going by and it's doing this. That's great for your mic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole body experience. It right? is a and whole body control, experience. Yeah. Whereas, whereas you don't always get that from anything else. Yeah. All right. So the last question that we have for today is why are there so many different models? And essentially, I mean, because technology advances because you find new ways to make even the most subtle improvements, you wanna, you wanna bring that, you wanna show that, share that with the world and make it a newer generation, make one step better than the previous. Not only do you have the philosophical, we wanna step up next best generation, you also have to step up and do so with the monetary value of that speaker or that product as well. Exactly. If you, so 
If the question is split into why so many generations, it's the first answer. Correct. If it's why are there so many individual models in different price points and so forth, then it's the it's the budgetary standpoint. Right. And and it's, it's the best way a manufacturer can go about uh, uh, trying to to please everyone, if you will. Yeah. You know. And I mean, my first set of clip speakers, I mean, real clip speakers, not headphones or anything like that, were the Synergy F3s. And that is equivalent to say the reference bass now. It's uh, it's the similar similar line, uh, and blew me away. They they sounded awesome. <laughs> so even the, the ability to bring in not low tier but like that middle of the line um, into an everyday home is just amazing. So yeah, the uh, you know people gave Klipsch a hard time over the Synergy product being sold at Best Buy, but as a big box store, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the, the great thing about that is it allowed so many other people that had no clue what Klipsch or real audio was to get a glimpse of it. And there's so many people that got that little glimpse or, or, or from that Pro Media speaker system. Oh yeah. <laughs> they got the glimpse of what a clip speaker could be. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're, I've, I've got, Chill bumps thinking oh, yeah. about it because it gets you every time if, you, if you're in it. You know, they, they start understanding what it means to have a real audio system. And, and to, to use word Paul Clips used, you know, it's either fidelity or infidelity. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when they, when they found out what real fidelity was on a speaker, they wanted to, be, uh, wanted to keep that. They don't want to give it up. So, I mean, essentially, why are there so many models? It's, like we said, to improve upon previous generation as technology moves forward and also to make these items accessible to a wider array of people so from the pro media system to the jubilee correct yeah. all right i think what's that's funny all. is i would venture to say that almost every jubilee system owner probably has a pro media <laughs> system <laughs> probably probably i would i would almost like to take a a, a, a a uh, poll <laughs> of how many people that have the the heritage line or the higher end clips product clip system actually started with pro media that would, well i mean if it tells you anything i do i i do all these uh edits as well when we're doing these youtube channel i shoot and edit everything as well but every single computer i have a lot of computers at my house you've seen how many <laughs> true every single computer has a dedicated pro media system <laughs> i love them <laughs> so I think that, that that about covers all the questions we have for today. Um, well, keep them coming. Yeah, we, we, need, <laughs> we need feedback to understand if, if folks are enjoying what we're doing here yeah. as far as the, the, these kinds of conversations. If uh, uh, in the future we hope to include more people into this conversation, um, uh, we're hoping maybe uh, uh, Steve and Corey will jump in and join us at some point and have a round table about some stuff. Yeah, and actually, specifically of the people whose questions we've answered so far, tell us how it's helped. I don't know about you, but I, I've enjoyed doing these Q&A sessions. I think they're pretty, pretty fun, and hopefully you guys are getting as much entertainment out of them as we enjoy doing them. <laughs> hey, everybody knows that I'm full of something, and he's sitting around talking is easy. <laughs> he's full of something. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Anyways, make sure you like and subscribe. Please comment below. Let us know if you have any further questions. And as I said before, let us know if this is helpful. Um, until, until next week, I'm Jason. I'm Trey. We'll see you we'll next week. See you week. later. So you got thrown out. They didn't like that question. Because you were you were calling them out on bullshit. <laughs> I had a fella show me how to do that a long time ago. <laughs> Gave me this little yellow button, told me to put it under my lapel and just use it. <laughs> they show off the bad and the good amplifiers as two. Amplifiers as well. <laughs> as two. As two. As also. <laughs> as also. <laughs> Say that last sentence one more time. Just so I don't know what the I said. What are you